welcome back everyone. So uh, I know there are several questions about the homework. Uh, yes, I had a question. Yep. Um, I had sent you an email earlier um, and I was wondering if anyone else had that same issue. So in racket, when I try to execute, well, when you execute open paren, list, close paren, you get the empty list back? Yes. But to go the other way with cons, I didn't quite get it because cons requires two arguments. Right. Uh, yeah. So that's a very important point. Um, a list is either empty or cons of um, something onto a list. In other words, um, this is, for example, like saying, uh, think about nats. A nat is a nat is either Z or a successor. This notation for a list allows you to construct. It would be like saying, for example, nat um, s s s, and that would be something which would construct um, s sub s sub s sub z. This is what this type of list builder notation means. But then if you look at something like list or uh, nots in this way. So uh, what I'm saying is suppose we had a not builder notation. Uh, where we could write Not um, s s for s of s of z. Or not with nothing for z. Right? So the way that you should think about it is that list is a unified notation uh, for constructing both the empty list and compound lists, which are constructed with a cons. Now, think about nats. If you want the nat z, you'll never be able to construct it with a successor, right? Say it one more time. So, uh, if you just had access in the world of nots to Z and the successor, you wouldn't be able to construct Z using the successor, right? Right. Z is never a successor. Well, similarly, the empty list is never cons of something onto a list. I understand that. Um, it's just that we're starting out with a cons, right? So. Oh. Well, this notation right here. Um, so suppose we had a notation like this for knots. Do you understand what this notation would do? So right now I only see black, a black screen. Oh, okay. Uh, ah. Do you see my screen now? I see your cursor moving, but I 
I can see your screen. Did you see my screen successfully last class? Yes. Um, I have a question. Oh, I see it now. Yes, okay, I can get to your question. Let me first uh, finish answering this question. Okay. So, oh, unless it's related to this, is it? Kind of. I was wondering, we were going over yesterday, like, what uh, classifies as values. So I was wondering what values are able to go in a list. Okay, I'll get to that next. Sure. Okay, okay so going back to the first question, um, suppose that we had a notation for constructing NATs, which we don't have available, where if you wrote NAT SS, that would construct the NAT S of S of Z. And if you just wrote NAT with no S's, it would construct Z. Yes, it's a similar problem. Right. Uh, then the question that you asked me at the start would be analogous to, it doesn't look like I can construct Z using the successor, uh, which is precisely the point. You can't. Uh, because a list is either the empty list or cons of a list, and these are two different variants of the objects of lists. The grammar of lists has two variants, and they're mutually exclusive. So, for example, when I talk about this list, the notation for that without using list builder notation would be the empty list. And that's a piece of notation that's valid and that you're allowed to use in your assignment. In fact, that's your assignment. The question is impossible to do without this notation. So this is the notation in racket for the empty list. Does that make sense? Yes, but I'm still unsuccessful to get it out <laughs> because it's, embedded it's not like it's at the end of the construct or the beginning it's right in the middle where you're working with cons. oh right well um I, I can give you one hint um draw an ast for that oh uh well you it's actually not it's not a good hint because uh you you start off in list notation right. um but you ESC should didn't help. Let me switch over for a second because this might help anyone who's looking at this problem. Do you see this screen now? Does everyone see my um, blackboard? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. yeah. So if we have something like, let's say, a list builder notation like this, and we start off with, let's say, list. Let's say we have the number one, and then to make things interesting, let's say we have list one, two. And then let's say we have the number zero. So I'll show you what this looks like. So uh, there, are, there are several levels of rewriting that you can do. Uh, the first level of rewriting is that you could look at this tree as, well, first off, this is a list. What is the first element of the list? Martin, uh, yeah. can you answer the question? Yeah. Um, is it uh, just one or is it yes. just one? No, it's just one. So what okay. is the first element of the list? What's the second element of the list? One? No. Second element? Okay. It's confusing. Is it uh, the whole thing in parens? Or... Yes. Yeah, okay. 
So the second element of the list is list one, two. And then the third element is zero, right? And so one level of rewriting, this isn't the complete level of rewriting, is that you could look at this list as, well, first off, any list. Okay, so the grammar for lists is that a list, I'll write it in capitals, uh, to not confuse with list writing notation, is either the empty list or cons. of any expression, well, let's say any value. Okay, let's say any expression onto a list. So in this case, looking at it, this list isn't empty. The list that we started with isn't empty. If it isn't the empty list, then it's cons of something onto a list, right? Mm -hmm. So we can start by rewriting it as cons. Then the first element is one. And what remains? What remains is this can be rewritten as cons of one onto the list that has two elements. The first is list one, two, and the second is zero. And then we start uh, doing that again. Uh, what's that list? Well, that list is a cons. And what is its first element? You said it before. It's uh, one. Uh, sorry, of of the t of uh, the rest of the list. Okay. Um, so it's um, the thing in parens and zero. Uh, that's the rest of the list. What is the first element of the rest of the list? Uh, the thing in parens. Yeah, yes, list one, two. Um, and list one, two can be written as how? So if we just look at list one, two, how would you write that as an AST? So at every stage, it's either the empty list or cons of something onto something, right? Is list one, two empty? No. So it's cons of something onto something. Uh, what is being consed onto what? One and two. But two is not a list. The second uh, thing has to be a list. So what is it being consed onto? It's a cons of um, nothing and two. Uh, what what is being const onto what? So what is the expression and what is the list? You said the right things, but you didn't tell me which was the expression and which was the list. Uh, the expression is one. Yes, and the list is, sorry, uh, not one, two, right? But it's two. Well, and the list is one. One is not a list. List one. Uh, oh, but we already have one and two dealt with. Okay. Uh, it's empty. Yes. So that's like the base case. That's like zero in the definition of a NAT. Um, so you should think of this list, which has two elements, as sort of a successor operation applied to the empty list twice, 
but instead of just applying a successor, you have that successor labeled with something. Although it's not actually a label, it's a child's, uh, another child's to the successor, right? Yes. So looking at our original list, we had one, and then we had cons, then the head of what was on the cons, uh, sorry, the head of uh, the rest of the list is list one, two. So we've already written, uh, found out what that looks like. That looks like we've just written it here, cons of one onto cons of two onto the empty list. And then what's left over? Uh, what is one being consed onto? Uh, sorry, what is this thing being consed onto? Uh, well, head zero. Well, is it, uh, it has to be a list, right? Okay. So, it, well, because it's cons of something onto a list, right? So that mm -hmm. list is either the empty list or cons. Which one is it? It has to be cons? Yes. Cons of what onto what? Zero. Good. And that's what it looks like. So remember, cons is always, uh, a list is either the empty list, which is denoted in special notation like that, or else it's cons of something onto another list. And that list in turn is either the empty list or cons of something onto something. Lists are like a stronger, you, there's an analogy to nats in that they're inductively constructed uh, with one constructor taking no parameters, what the empty list being like zero. Uh, the successor case though is replaced with this cons, which, which has something being cons onto what you had before. But the analogy with nats should be uh, somewhat apparent. Does that answer all of your questions? I still don't see it. <laughs> I mean, I, I understand this demonstration, but. So let's do another example. What about the list uh, with uh, only one member as the empty list? What's this? So first off, is that cons or is that empty? It's cons. Yes. Cons of what onto what? Uh, empty onto empty. No? Good. So that's where I'm stuck. <laughs> and I can't get out of this mindset. <laughs> so I'd recommend that you look at these two examples. I think the second example might have been useful uh, as well, because uh, the, uh, the cons empty onto empty is not the empty list. It's a cons. That is distinct from, so. Okay. So in the, the ASD list. tree, I can substitute any of the subtrees at the bottom like uh, that has cons by um, empty. Uh, well, as an example, this is a list. This right here is an AST for a list. Right. So I can I... always cons anything onto that, right? Mm -hmm. Right. 
So, but if I go down this tree that you were just looking at, and you keep going right, so the roots is cons, and then the next one to the right is cons, mm -hmm. and then the next one is cons. So that last cons I could replace by empty, empty list. Right. So what that would do to the original list is it would remove zero from the list. Mm -hmm. So actually, this list has three elements in it. And you can see that it has three elements in it based on this top level structure. It's the empty list with something cons on to it. So the empty list has zero elements. Then you've cons on zero onto it. You have one element. Then you've cons on something else to it, list one, two and you have two elements, and then you cons on one, and now you have three elements. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll try it again. Okay, uh, I'd like to answer Amanda's question now. Thank you. So can you say it again, please? Amanda? Yeah. What was your question? I was asking um, what values can be in a cons? Like we were going over values yesterday and I was wondering like what is allowed in and what is not allowed. Okay. Um, so rackets will allow you to put any value in. Uh, you can cons any value onto a list. Oh, okay. Now um, the buts uh, uh, today, I'm going to present a perspective where uh, you might want to restrict what values you put onto a list. Because, for example, um, let's say we want to write a function uh, that sums the numbers in a list. Well, it, it would expect a list of numbers as inputs. And then it would apply sum. For example, we were writing sum list. Uh, if you passed it a list of something that didn't have numbers as its elements, then you'd run into an issue. You'd get an error when you try to add. Yes. Yeah. So, um, we can, uh, for example, we had this most general, uh, so. Well, can you add like variables? Like, could you in a list add like X and one together? Ah, uh, so what happens is that uh, list cons uh, acts a bit like a function. Um, so if you want to cons uh, some expression, let's say exp uh, one onto um, expression two. then uh, what's going to happen is that first bracket will evaluate expr1 and then expr2. At which point, both are values. So for example, um, if expression one was a variable name, then it would get looked up uh, and possibly cause an error if it's undefined. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and this raises an error if undefined. Mm 
Similarly, the list actually has to be computed as well. Um, so uh, we can actually uh, define values um, in rackets. Here, let me show you this. Can everyone see my screen now? Yes. Okay, so this is a grammar that I wrote for Racket. This doesn't contain absolutely everything, and um, some of the rules change the grammar of Rackets. For example, defining structures introduces new names and new constructs into the language. But if we don't actually define structs at the moment, uh, then this is what Racket looks like. A program is a series of either definitions or expressions. And here are the three types of definitions. Don't worry about structs at the moment. And here are a series of expressions. Um, so something like cons and list, those constructions, uh, I would group them under primitive operations. Now, um, so there are some things which I call atomic values. Atomic values are values that don't have any further substructure. They're not structured, they're just values. So for example, true, false, the empty list. Um, now, number, string, symbol, and character, these are things which Racket recognizes and which the grammar doesn't define. So there are lots of ways you can write down a number in Rackets. Strings are always enclosed in quotes. I haven't spoken about symbols yet, uh, but those were some um, types of values which we discussed at the starting lecture. Now there's also list values. So a list value is either the empty list or it's cons of a value onto a list value. Now, you can write cons of an expression onto an expression where those expressions are not necessarily values or list values, uh, but then that would not be a value. Uh, instead, that would be some form of expression of this form, and uh, it would start uh, evaluating the arguments cons of something onto something, both of those things would need to get evaluated. But if finally you get into this stage where a list value is a value cons onto a list value, well, a list value is, yes, or the empty list, uh, then that defines what list values are. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. Go ahead. So, I mean, so you're basically just allowed to put anything, just depending on what you do with the list will define what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do, right? Like, yes. whatever the purpose of the list is. And Racket will try and evaluate um, both expressions. And if, for example, uh, it evaluates the second expression to something, to some value, and that value is not a list value, then it will raise an error. Okay. So if I, and by the way, uh, this is something that isn't true in Scheme, uh, but it is true here and you should bear it in mind. I'll switch to Racket for a second. Uh, so if I try and do, for example, cons of uh, one onto one, in this language, it'll complain saying second argument must be a list received a one. And in general, it would actually have to do some computation uh, because I could write, for example, something like cons of one onto if true um, one empty list. So Right now, this is some compound expression, and Racket doesn't know if uh, what type of value it'll produce. 
In fact, if instead of true, I had some complicated thing, uh, then in general, Racket would need to evaluate the entire complicated thing before it could determine whether this is a list or a number. But Racket will evaluate that. And um, if I, for example, take this expression that produces an error and I put it into the stepper, Does everyone see my screen now? Okay, so I'm trying to cause one onto this expression right here. That's not a value at the moment. Um, it's some if expression. Uh, the list of values there that I gave before does not include if expressions. Now, uh, so Racket will try and evaluate that because um, for cons to go through, thinking of it as a procedure, Although if con, uh, although as the stepper will write it, uh, cons of a value onto a list value will, well, it will get converted into list notation in this language. In beginning student, it would just be written in terms of cons. But okay, so that gets evaluated. Then you get a one. And then on your next step, it says, oh, but I drag and now recognizes this as a value. And it checks, uh, is it a list value? And it finds that no, it's not a list value. And now that it's not a list value, it complains. Okay. So the list will either reduce itself to like the final form or it'll produce an error if there's something wrong, right? Yes. Uh, but what uh, the new concept that I introduced in answering your question is that of final forms of values, there is a notion of a list value. Yes. Where a list value is defined as either um, empty or any value consed onto a list value. So going back to that grammar, values are either atomic values or list values. Atomic values are any of these just values with no further structure. And a list value is any value, meaning possibly a list value or an atomic value as defined here, consed onto a list value. Yes, yeah. Oh, and then um, as for the rules governing lists, um, if we ignore list builder notation and just think of it in terms of cons, uh, then there are really two important functions that apply for cons. Cons are constructed from two pieces of data, right? What you're consing something onto something. Um, so if you have a cons value, which is going to be cons of some value cons onto some value, that value better be a list value or else it's going to produce an error. But um, once you have a list value, if you take the first of that list value, it'll just produce the head of the list, V1. And if you take rest of it, it'll just produce V2, the rest of the list. Okay. Now you can't apply first and rest to the empty list. If you apply first or rest to the empty list, you'll get an error. And yeah. Since you have these two ways of constructing lists, either cons or the empty list, uh, both of them have associated predicates. Uh, for any value, you can check whether that value is the empty list or whether that value is cons. Yeah. So uh, of all possible values listed here, uh, these ones, well, the empty list is listed twice, but that's only because I've included in here. So it's not exactly, it, it would be mutually exclusive if I didn't list this twice. But ignoring the fact that it's listed twice, all of these options are mutually exclusive. 
and uh, Racket gives you predicates uh, for determining which one of these mutually exclusive categories a value falls in. And in the case of list values, those predicates are empty, question mark, and cons, question mark. Yeah, okay. Okay. Does anyone have any other questions? Uh, professor, can I yep. ask a question about the normal set? Yep. Uh, so, so if I pass the test, uh, what I get is uh, it will say that I passed. But if uh, I don't, if I don't pass the test, uh, the would the outcome be error or something else? Yes. Uh, so if you don't uh, pass the test, there are several ways in which the test could fail. Um, it could run out of time. It could run out of memory. Um, those would happen if your program had an infinite loop. Well, not all infinite loops cause memory outs. Infinite loops that make things bigger and bigger would cause memory outs. Or if you wrote some incredibly ridiculously inefficient uh, algorithm, which uh, I'm not going to test it on large inputs. Uh, or it could happen that your program just encountered an error while running. Or it could happen that your program produced outputs within the constraints, but uh, it was the wrong answer. And so you'll get an error message. Now, um, as I mentioned in an email, uh, I'm happy that I ran a uh, warm-up assignment because it was really a warm-up for me. I changed the testing features, uh, the test suit I had, three times. Uh, and in the beginning, it accepted anyone's solution, including empty solutions because I accidentally put my solution inside of it and then it overrid it. Uh, so can everyone please check Marmoset again and uh, their solutions have been regraded and some scores changed. Uh, yeah, so the thing is, uh, I used one of my release tokens to check the result uh, of the release tests. And uh, for the last one in particular, the points that it did displays uh, for me, it's a question mark. And the name of that test is also a question mark. And uh, the that's because I switched um, test suits. Um, if you look at Marmoset again, um, it should have retested that submission, hopefully. If not, send me an email. Sure. OK. OK, thank you. OK. Anyone else? So also, I've uploaded uh, the next two homeworks, um, but I don't have Marmoset tests for them yet. And one of them is, um, doesn't have all of the details in it yet. Uh, they have the problems, but I'm going to post more suggestions. Uh, but I'm also today really going to discuss about how to solve problems like this. So the first homework assignment is going to be this problem. Uh, it's uh, both problems are list manipulation problems. The first is to write two functions, unique left and unique right, where given a list of any type of value, left will return that list, removing every single occurrence except for the leftmost occurrence um, of any of its elements. So for example, in here, um, it's given a list four, two, one, three, two, four. Uh, four hasn't been encountered in the list, so I leave it. One hasn't been encountered. Two hasn't been encountered, so I leave it. Now, the next one, I've already seen it. Uh, so that's not in the output list. Three, I keep. And then two and four, I've already seen, so I don't include them. Now, a complementary function to this is unique rights which takes in a list and returns a list with all but the rightmost occurrence of each element removed. And I'd like you to write, well, first off, Racket has a built-in function reverse that'll reverse a list. You are not allowed to use it, and I'll check if you use it. You're not allowed to implement anything similar. Uh, your two solutions here should be unique. <laughs> 
And I also want you to write them in a certain way, which I'll explain today in lecture. Uh, ignoring the constraints, uh, does everyone understand uh, what the question is? What these functions are supposed to do? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then the final problem, which um, I haven't explained in full detail, uh, I'm going to explain it more carefully. And this, both of these problems are tricky. Uh, but the last problem is especially trickier. Uh, you have to have a function that takes in a list and returns a list whose elements are all possible permutations of the input list. So that's all possible ways to reorder the elements. And you should assume that every single element is distinct. Uh, so for example, if your list is list one, one, then there are two permutations of list one, one. Um, formally think of the ones as distinct and output both ways to shuffle it around. On your inputs, Okay, uh, but I'll add in more details for that. And I'll explain what a permutation is in this question uh, description as well. Uh, but this problem is especially tricky. And I'll provide a few hints on how to solve it. Uh, so I've set the dates for those as Saturday and Sunday. And I don't have marmoset tests set up for them yet. I guess I have a secret one for this one. Uh, but this one I still need to set up, but hope both should be up by today before I go to bed. Okay, let's get on with some content. So, I would like to explain to you how it is that um, you should generally think about writing programs. Um, at before explaining how to do it. I'm going to give an example uh, that we saw before uh, from a theoretical perspective. So remember back when we were discussing nats, we had plus and we had add for nats. And your second homework problem was to prove that add was equal to plus. Now, why did we define add? And why didn't we, why did we define plus uh, instead of add? Uh, it looks like it would have been theoretically easier to deal with add than plus. Well, let's see. So let's consider the proposition that um, add, well, for all nats n, add z n equals n. So this looks like the plus z proposition. We could call it the add z proposition. And um, if we were trying to prove it, so I'm just going to give a sketch of the proof. Uh, sketch an attempt. Uh, so let's say we try and argue by structural induction. And I should remind you of what the rules are. The rules are that um, add of anything with Z reduces to anything and add 
of anything with the successor of anything moves the successor over to the first argument. Um, so for when we try to do case Z, what we needed to prove is uh, I'm not going to follow my pattern to um, the thing. So I, I'm being very rough here. What we would like to prove is that um, add Z, Z is Z, and that's easy. So we can do that. That's just justified by one rule application. Uh, for the other one, we'd like to prove that um, if add Z K equals to K, again, this is, uh, uses, uh, this is after using the anonymous method. If that's then add Z S of K equals S of K. Now, what we encounter then when we start calculating is you take the first line and the old, really the only thing that you can do is move the S over. And now you're stuck. In fact, you're fairly stuck because uh, the inductive case always spoke about add a ZK. And suddenly you don't have S of Z. Uh, sorry, suddenly you don't have Z. You have S of Z. And so in terms of using the inductive hypothesis, the definition of add isn't very helpful because as soon as you apply one reduction step to the successor case, you have something that looks completely different from your inductive hypothesis. And in fact, if you try and prove properties about add, uh, even things like the commutativity of add or plus um, or add this property about add, the easiest way to do it is to show that add is the same as plus. Now, why is that? That's because add is a function that's defined in reference to the structure of the second arguments. And if you, for example, tried to calculate add n of s of k, then that reduces to add S of n k. But uh, this is a different calculation. This is a different, this is not easily seen to be related. Uh, th to just add nk. So for example, plus n s of k reduced in one step to s plus nk. And that is more easily related. to plus nk. If you think about the steps that happen in the calculation, uh, the way that they're modified here is that all of them are just enclosed in uh, S on the outside. Whereas here, you have some modification to arguments on the inside. 
and it's very hard to prove results about it. This suggests a general way uh, about how to write functions about add. So for example, if you were trying to define a function, a function on NATS, uh, it would be nice to write it write it as in the following form. So let's say the function is f. And this is in math notation. Uh, you would say that f of z is something and that f of s of k is something in terms of f of k. But where the only recursive call is exactly uh, to uh, what's immediately inside of the arguments. It's you unwrap one level of structure and you specify how to go from the definition of f of k to the definition of f of s of k. And so such a function is called structurally recursive. So when you're thinking about how to write structurally recursive functions, what you should think is, suppose that I want to, well, you want to define a function and the function is supposed to solve some problem. So really we're about to talk about structurally recursive functions on lists. Uh, right, it's easier to give the example in terms of lists. So remember, that a list is either the empty list or cons of something onto some list. Let's write it like this. Uh, so suppose you wanted to find some function on lists. on lists. Then the structurally recursive way to do this is as so. Uh, you say what the function is on the empty list. This is in math notation, is something. And then your other function, when applied to a cons argument, so the thing that I want to say here is that um, this definition, uh, well, you really have no information here. The only information that you have is that you have the empty list. So you, you define it to be something. In here, uh, you have some information about the argument. You have V and you have L. Um, so in order to access that information, you can write first 
V. So that gives you the head of the list. And then uh, you can access the tail. And you might want to make a recursive call on the tail. And uh, the only way in which you interact with the inputs is uh, in this way. So you either make a recursive call on the tail um, or you take its first element. And then given that information, you specify how to combine those two things together to give the answer here. Now, um, I want to say one more, uh, okay, does anyone have any questions about that? I'm going to give an example. Okay, so let me go back to Racket. Uh, so the first thing that I want to tell you is uh, about another notation for a. Okay, I'll erase this. A better, uh, a quicker way to write conditionals to test for conditions. So, uh, for example, you could say if something then something else something, right? But suppose that one of those other clauses also has another condition, or you want to test for multiple things. Well, a different notation is cond statements. So cond statements are a bit like if statements, except for the fact that they have multiple conditions and results. So you could write, for example, condition true, uh, true, and then let's say the result is going to be zero. Well, if I run this, I just get zero. But now I could say, for example, condition false. And then that condition will fail. And then look at the next condition. And let's say that's true. And that has one. These aren't values. I can make them values like this. True and false are uh, names that, um, evaluates to these values. So here, the first condition failed. And so it looked at the second condition and that was true. And that became the results. Now suppose this is false as well. Then in beginning student with list abbreviations, what will happen is it'll say that all of the results were false. You'll get an error. And you can have as many results as you want. Uh, and following those results, optionally, you can write else. And um, if there's an else at the end of your cont, then no matter what, um, either one of these two cases will work or it'll go with the else case. So uh, the way that I wrote what, how cond works in these notes is that co a cond consists of multiple of these clauses. Um, the first clause is an expression which gets evaluated to a value. Now, if the value is false, I should put a hash there, uh, then it discards this and rewrites the statement just in terms of what remains. On the other hand, if it's true, then it'll go with this answer. And it won't evaluate this answer before, eval before checking the condition. It, the, it just checks the condition, then if it's true, the entire thing gets rewritten with that results. And if it's false, then that entire thing gets discarded and it just looks at the statement without it. 
And then if you eventually get down to an else, if you have an else, then it'll always just go down to the answer. So these are the rules for conditionals. Any questions about that? So in particular, I'm going to give you an example. Uh, so think about the function sum list. Now, what does this function do? Uh, sum list is going to take a list of numbers and it's going to produce a number, right? And how did we define it? Well, uh, I'm now going to define it using a cond instead of an if. So first off, I'm going to check if the list is empty. And if the list is empty, then uh, what is the sum list? What should sum list return? Zero. Yep. Uh, we can also write a description. Sum list sums the numbers in the list. So that closes off this condition. Now for the other one, if it's not empty, we can put an else clause. And now, if we were trying to write this structurally recursively, then what we would know is that we have some thing, um, and somehow we have the information of first list. And we also have the information of rest list. And we're going to use the information about rest list in order to make a recursive call. So a function written structurally recursively uh, for some list, the way that you think about it is you first check if it's the empty list and then you say what happens. Otherwise, um, you can suppose that some list is a function that you've defined that works correctly. Now, if you apply some list to the rest of the list, you're going to get the sum of the rest of the numbers in the list, right? And then you also have the information of the first number in the list. How do I combine these two pieces of information to give me the result that I want? Uh, we can sum the first uh, element of the list with the rest of the list. Right. So if I know the sum of the elements in the tail of the list, and I know the first element of a list, then I can get the sum of all of the elements in the input list by adding the first value in the list to the sum list of the rest of the list. So, okay, then how, uh, okay, going back to here. Then in rackets, 
Uh, to right. A structurally recursive. Recursive function on list. Uh, use the templates. So you're going to define a function, uh, whatever it's called, my func. And let's say that it's a function that takes only a single list parameter. Then the structurally recursive way to do this would be to have your body be a con statement where first it checks if your list is empty. And then it does something. So here dot, dot, dot just means something that I have yet to write. It's not a grammar rule. And otherwise, well, you don't know what you're going to do, but you know that you have the information of the first of the list. And you can take the rest of the list and you can apply the function recursively to it. Closing the cond, closing the define. So a general way to solve the problem about how to write a list uh, function on lists, it's similar to working out how to prove a theorem by induction. In fact, there's a close connection between the two of them that I'll make explicit in a moment by proving results about uh, functions. It's um, you start off with a problem that you want to solve and you explain to yourself, what is the problem that I'm going, trying to solve? And then you say, okay, I want to write a function to solve that problem. And suppose that function in the course, uh, you know, is going to take a single list argument. Then a good way to solve, write a function that solves your problem is to say, well, what should the value of my function be if it's fed the empty list based on the description of the problem that I have. Okay, you figure that out, you write it down. Next, what happens next? Then you want to say, suppose I know, suppose that I have the outputs uh, of what would happen if I ran this function on the rest of the list. Then how do I go from that information and the information of what I've const onto that list together? How does that information give me the answer that I want uh, for my problem of apply to list? So for example, if I'm trying to design the function sum list, sum list, then for the, the cons case, I notice that Let's say if I have, I know, know the value of 
of uh, some list. L. Then some list of cons of some number onto L should be Well, how do I obtain it? Well, I take n and I add it to the sum list of L. That's how I go from the information of um, sum list L to the information of sum list cons n L. And as you can imagine, when you write functions like this, it's much easier to prove theorems about them inductively. Any questions? Okay, so before, So this is a structurally recursive function. And in general, when you're trying to solve a problem, um, for example, the problems in the homework, you should approach the problems in this way. And by the way, sometimes you may say, well, how do I go from this piece of information and this piece of information to the results? And sometimes you may say, well, okay, it's complicated. The description of how I do that is complicated. Perhaps I need to write another function in order to facilitate that. And that's like discovering that you need to prove a new lemma in the course of a proof. Now, um, before we had another version of the function uh, that was not structurally recursive. And let's say, let's call that function helper, uh, some helper. And so it took a list and it also took an accumulator. So it's going to take a list of numbers and an accumulator, which is going to be a number. Uh, now, in order to write that there are two arguments, I'm going to do this. This is just a comment, right? So this function takes a list of numbers and a number, and it returns a number. And it should return uh, the sum, returns the sum of the numbers in the list with the accumulator. And if you have access to an accumulator, well, so you should still write the function with a cond at the top level. If it's empty, then what should my result be? Let's look, read the description. Sums returns the sum of the numbers in the list with the 
uh, in numbers in the list with the accumulator. So what if the accumulator is non-zero? Then it just returns whatever's in the accumulator. So it should return the accumulator, right. So remember, the uh, last time I motivated this function in saying, well, what does the computational trace of some list look like? Well, it just keeps putting on pluses out front, and it only collapses those pluses at the very end. Uh, there, if you were given a list of numbers and you try to sum them, the most natural way to do it would just be to start with zero and then start adding each number in a row to it, right? Um, and if, if you want to implement that strategy, then in the other case of uh, some helper, uh, what do you do? So if you have a cons, then uh, what should uh, some helper return? And this is written non-structurally recursively. And the accumulator is going to be increased with a Which? sum. Um, we can call some helper again, and the uh, list value would be the rest of the list, and the accumulator would be the original accumulator plus the first of that list. Uh, so, so, uh, sorry, plus accumulate, oh, uh, first list. You take the accumulator and you tack on the first of the list to it. Let's just, for the sake of, it might be slightly easier to put the accumulator as the second argument to the plus. So the intuition behind this uh, function, that closes that con, that closes the con, that closes the define, good, is that uh, it operates by keeping a running tally, uh, but let's also write uh, uh, some, some list two. And uh, it's actually going to be this time. So I, I, w I actually want to write a sumless function. This function takes two parameters. Um, if I want to write uh, some helper two, that just takes a list. Uh, what do I do if I want to, uh, sorry, uh, some list two? if I want to call some helper. So I just want to fill in the second argument with something. Right now, this isn't uh, a function that takes a list of numbers to a number, it takes a second parameter. Uh, we can just call some helper uh, list and zero. Okay, so I've now provided two different functions that sum the numbers in a list. The first function is written in a structurally recursive way. Um, that means that it looks at what the sum list of the rest of the list is. It takes the first element of the list and it figures how to combine those two together to get the answer that I want. The second function is not structurally recursive. In particular, it changes the second argument that's being called. So if you, for example, cons on something to a list, the computational trace would look very different from the original computational trace because all of these numbers would be rather different. And then uh, in order to use this function of an accumulator, um, I also supply the accumulator with a default value. So that's a general way that you can write recursion with an accumulator. And then this also works. Um, if I do some helper, some list 
two on list one, two, three, I get six as before. So um, this is also, this is not structurally recursive. It makes a non-structurally recursive call. And now um, we're going to take a break. And then after the break, um, I'm going to try and prove the theorem that some list sums the elements of a list. And that will actually be very easy to see, that some list sums the elements of the list because it's written structurally recursively. Now, the statement that some helper sums the elements of the list is going to be much harder to prove. And we're going to see that we're going to have to change the result that we're trying to prove in order to get it. And this will show that in general, functions which are written structurally recursively are much better behaved theoretically. You have to really work hard to prove the correctness of a function that is written in a non-structurally recursive way. Okay, so let's take a break until uh, 3.05. Or, uh, but first, does anyone have any questions before we take a break? Uh, yeah. Uh... I have a question about the computational trace of the if statements. So yes. if there is true or false, like in within them, uh, do I use hash before that, or oh, it's uh, I mentioned in the question. I no, I mentioned in the email actually um, that uh, this is the computational trace in the universe of. Um, conditional expressions, not in racket. So you use true. Instead not, of hash. You don't write hashes. It's not hashes. racket. It's um, the rules defined in the email. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll see that. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. So let's go until uh, 3.05. Unless anyone else has a question. I have a question, but maybe yep. for later down in in uh, in your presentation. Um, well, so right now our functions are returning numbers. Uh, yes. Can you also demonstrate a function that returns something else, like a list? How you would sure. write that? Sure. I'll uh, write the function reverse that takes a list and reverses the order of things inside it. Perfect. I'll do that after the break. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll be back in a minute. 
Okay. Uh, does anyone have any other questions before I answer the one that was just asked? I guess there are two minutes left, but it, I'll listen to questions during those two minutes. Okay, let's resume. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so let's just give another example. Consider, so Racket has a built-in function reverse. Uh, if you feed in the function, let's just check it that it does has it. In this version, good. So if you take reverse the list one, two, three, then you'll get the list three, two, one. Now um, on your homework, you have to write the function unique left and unique right. And if you write one of these functions, you can write the other function. Uh, you can write a function that accomplishes this goal by reversing the list that you take feeding it into the other function, and then reversing the output. You are not allowed to do that. Um, and I'll check that you don't do that. I'll check that you don't call the function reverse, and then I'll manually check that you haven't written something that has that effect. Both functions have to be written on their own right. But let's uh, try and implement the function reverse. Uh, since it's built in and we can't redefine built-in functions, I'm going to call it my reverse. And this is going to take a list of, and really you don't care what things are in the list. They don't need to be numbers, right? You can, for example, say reverse list, list, let's say, by the way, these are symbols. Um, so And then it'll reverse the order of the elements in the list. And notice that within this list, it's just an element. So this list, it doesn't like recursively call um, reverse on any list arguments. It just reverses the th order of the three elements in the list. So my reverse, it doesn't have to take a list of numbers. It can take a list of any value. So I'll write list of any. And then the output again will be list of any. We can actually make the this more precise. For example, if it takes a list of numbers, then it also returns a list of numbers. Um, you could write maybe uh, for any, no, uh, that's too complicated uh, at the moment. And so my reverse re uh, reverses the order of elements in list. <laughs> 
and I can give an example. Um, my reverse. So what's the most natural way to write this function? Well, what's, yeah. You could go for the tail of the list and then uh, write that first. So you'd like to reverse the tail of the list? Yes. So if we were going to write this function in a structurally recursive way, so if we wanted to write this function in a structurally recursive way, we try, whoops, and do this. Now I want, Um, so before we write a structurally recursive function, uh, arguably it's more appealing to the intuition to write a function that's not structurally recursive for this. So uh, putting it a different way, uh, let me show you on paper. So if you, for example, um, look at reverse list one, two, three, then the inputs looks like this. Right? Everyone sees that that's what list one, two, three looks like? Yes. And then reverse. Should take that and the list that it should produce looks like this. So in particular, if you cons on anything onto this, uh, that really changes the structure of the last answer. It sort of modifies the structure of the last answer at the bottom instead of at the top. Uh, now, does anyone see a non-structurally recursive way to write this function? So suppose we were doing it for an accumulator, where the accumulator is going to be the answer eventually. So, okay, let's suppose we're writing it like this. Let's suppose we're writing reverse helper. <laughs> 
And then if the list is empty, we just return the accumulator. And otherwise, what should we do? Cons the first of the list onto the accumulator. Good. And why does that work? Because the first element in our list is the outer element of that list. But when you cons it on the accumulator, um, it becomes the innermost element of the good. accumulator. Good. That's a good way to put it. So what that structure looks like is then, as you put it, um, we have cons, for example. Um, let's say cons, three cons. Or uh, it's actually easier to write it in non-AST form. Um, actually, no. It's easier to just implement it and look at the computational trace. That saves me from having to write. By the way, um, let me just check one thing. If I write this, Uh, so uh, the beginning student languages uh, support this notation uh, for writing something that you haven't written yet. So for example, if you type in my reverse list, this isn't a fu full function definition, but it will accept the definition without error. Um, it'll tell you what as the error. It says that this function isn't finished. It's not a finished expression. It's a template. Um, so the teaching languages let you write templates. Um, if there is any occurrence of an ellipsis within uh, a function definition, it tells you that that stands for any expression that's not yet finished and that the function isn't usable. But it won't throw an error when you're trying to define the function. Um, so it just lets me, using this, lets me press run and write something else uh, without seeing errors. So dot, dot, dot stands for any expression possible. So reverse helper is going to take a list of any and another list of any just to make the arguments clearly separated. I'll put parentheses around them. And what was the answer? What do I do? Someone else tell me. Uh, restless. And then what do I do to the accumulator? Uh, and 
counts first list and accumulate. And now let's just have the stepper go through the definition of reverse helper. Let's say list one, two, three, and then the empty list. Okay, everyone sees the stepper? Yes. Right, so there are a bunch of definitions there. And uh, you should ignore what happens when you have templates. Um, so ignore the things above it. Uh, anyway, concentrate only on this line, the definition of reverse helper um, and this uh, call. So ignore everything else above it. So it's going to expand. Uh, and well, it's not the empty list. So it's going to ignore that condition. Then it's just going to go with the else clause, which is reverse helper. And um, it's going to call reverse helper. Well, first it's going to remove the else clause. And now I just have reverse helper. Uh, the first thing is the rest of the list. That's what I'm calling it on. And the accumulator gets changed as follows. So first I take the rest of the list and then I cons uh, the first of this list, which is one, onto the accumulator, which is previously empty. And so I get one here. Then in the next call, I, again, it's not the empty list. I go to the else clause. It goes to the else clause. I take the rest of the list. I take the first of the list. I const that onto the accumulator. I make the recursive call. Now, um, if I look at pre recursive calls at the top, I have previous call and next call. And then if I do multiple steps until the next recursive call, it starts off with uh, reverse helper list one, two, three, and the empty list. In the next call, it's moved one over into the accumulator. Then it's moved two over into the accumulator. And then it's moved three over into the accumulator. So look at that. So look, I look at the green here. Is everyone looking at the green? So uh, after several steps, reverse helper just takes the first element of the list if it's not empty, and it moves it over onto the accumulator. And then it moves the next element over onto the accumulator and it moves the third element over onto the accumulator. And then when you have an empty list, well, then it just, the first condition happens, it's empty, and so it just returns the accumulator. And so Question. that's it returning the accumulator. Yep. How does it know that the accumulator is a list and not a number? Uh, so when I wrote that the function returns a list of any, uh, that's, was a comment. It's not part of the language. I know that it returns a list of any because I can prove a theorem that says that. But as far as Racket is concerned, um, it doesn't know the type of the return arguments. Racket can tell if you have a value, Racket can determine the type of the value. Uh, but other than that, it doesn't enforce things like ensuring that a function returns something of a particular value. So no, Racket can't tell that it will return a list just from the definition of a function. But at this stage, it's supposed to return, it says that, okay, the result of this expression is this, just list. Also, you shouldn't necessarily think of it as a function returning something. You should also think of it as just, we have rules that rewrite the program. The program is rewriting itself. And so this rewrite rule says, well, this just, this condition, it's true here. So this entire thing just gets rewritten into this. And then what are function calls? 
function calls are nothing but rules that tell you how to rewrite um, things when you have a name followed by two values. This is a name, this is two values. What do the rules say about this? Well, if you have a name and then the things following it are values, then it looks up the name in either the things that are predefined or in the user defined definitions. And there is a user definition, defined definition for this. So then it takes the body, the expression that follows the definition. It takes every occurrence of list. It substitutes it with the empty list. It takes every occurrence of accumulator and it substitutes it with the list that's in the accumulator. And then you see here that here, list has been replaced with the empty list. The accumulator has been replaced with list 321. Uh, list has again been replaced with the empty list. Uh, first list, the list is replaced with the empty list again, and the accumulator is replaced with this again. And so it's just the program rewriting itself by these rules. In the same way that we saw addition as being just rewrites that happen based on the rules. Now, uh, the, you will get an error when the program is uh, at a stage in which uh, it, the expression that you're trying to evaluate is not a value and no rules apply. So for example, if you have an undefined name, then there's no rule that expands that name. And so the fact that the name is not a value and that there is, the name hasn't been defined means that no rules apply to the name and then you throw an error. Uh, you can think of that as another way in which Racket throws errors. Rackets will throw errors if uh, it's asked to evaluate any expression to which no rules apply. So for example, if you try and add a number with a bool, no rules apply on how to form that addition. And so that's when it throws an error. That's one way to think about it. It doesn't have to be the way that you think about it. Does that answer your question? That was, that was an indirect answer. Uh, yes. But yeah, Racket doesn't know what it's going to return. And in fact, you, um, in a certain way of thinking about Racket, um, you don't even have to think about functions as function calls. You just think of it as rewrites, uh, the program rewriting itself. In that case, uh, types can be described as, it says that I have, okay, does everyone see the screen now? It says that I have two different things that are potentially what I want to show you. Does everyone see? Yes, yes. Can someone confirm that they see yes. the screen? Good. So uh, now we understand how this helps. And then we can write, so this is a non-structurally recursive. Uh, definition. And um, now this has an accumulator. How do I write it? Um, let's say my reverse two. And um, I'm now going to write it calling uh, the function that has an accumulator. So how do I do that? Could you try calling reverse helper list an empty set? Yep. Empty list, not set. Empty list, sorry, yeah. So, um, I, the, the accumulator should start off with the empty list, whereas here the accumulator started off with zero. So that's also a clause that's important. You need to start your accumulator off at the right value. And if you think about the type involved in the function, which again is just a user abstraction at the moment, uh, then that should suggest what the accumulator should be. Because if, if you follow this general template of writing accumulator, where at the base case, you just return the accumulator, or maybe some trivial modification of, 
it's if you know trivial modification you want, then anyway, you work from that, from the types, and then you get what you should start the accumulator off as. So that's a non-structurally recursive way to write it. Now, suppose that we want to write it in a structurally recursive way. So in other words, if I have a way to reverse the tail, and then I have the first element of the list, how do I use those two pieces of information together to get to um, uh, reversing the full list? You can't just cons it onto the front. What you sort of want to do is you want to take the empty list at the bottom of that list in the cons thing and replace it with um, cons um, first list empty, right? So in other words, I'm going to put it in red. If I, for example, cons on zero, then what uh, reverse would have to do is it would have to replace this with cons zero empty list, but you can't replace things with things directly. You have to build a new list in order for this to happen, right? Like, you can't just say, I'm going to change what was cons on. You have to construct a completely different list in order to handle this. And so how would you do that? By the way, does anyone not see um, what happens when you cons on something to reverse, how the list changes? from this picture. Uh, it's important that you understand this. So please ask a follow-up question. Does everyone understand? Come on, if you don't, uh, please ask. So you were asking if we understand how this leads to a reverse list? Uh, ha what happens uh, if you cons on something onto a list? Uh, how does the reverse of the new list look like relative to the reverse of the old list? Uh, yeah, I see. If you, if you con zero on the actual list, then you're just flipping it. It has to go at the bottom, right? Yeah. Zero has to be the last element of the list. So cons, originally, cons you knew that one was the last element because it was const onto the empty list. But now you want to replace this with this. But in Racket, you don't have a way to rewrite things. So you'd have to take this list and you have to construct it from scratch. Hmm. So if yeah. we wanted to write this in a structurally recursive way, then we would need to, how would we update it? We need some way of going from reverse of the rest of the list to this list, right? And we could do that by defining another function, right? Yeah. So what should that function be called? What's a good name for that function based on this description? Mm. It's like reverse extra. Uh, but uh, it, it's the function makes sense independently of reverse. It does something specific. Append. Sure. Very good. So we want to define a function append. Append takes what? Let's say it takes anything, and it also any type of value. And then let's say it takes a list of any. Yep, let's do it like this. 
and then append um, places constructs a list in which um, the first, uh, let's say, in which, okay, let, then let, let's give these parameters names. In which el elements is placed at the end of uh, placed at the end of LSC. And uh, we want to do this in a structurally recursive way. So um, we never have to change ELC, right? Uh, elements just stays there for any recursive call. So let's define this in a structurally recursive way. So if I'm trying to, okay, so if for a structurally recursive uh, function, this is the template. Then I'm going to do whatever. And somehow in whatever I'm going to use, um, well, I can use elements. I can use that information. I can use the first of the list. And I can use append elements to the rest of the list. In fact, you shouldn't even do this like this. So this is the template for writing um, append in a structurally recursive way. Uh, okay, so if you're trying to append something onto the empty list, what happens? Someone who hasn't answered yet for about, um, uh, about how to define these functions. I want someone new. Do you uh, clarify what you're asking for? Uh, yes. So uh, the function append here, uh, I can write an example. I'd like to append should be some function that, for example, when it takes, um, well, let's say we want to append, uh, let's say 17 onto the list that has one, two, and three. Then, that should be this list. And I'd like to write this function and it's going to be written recursively and I'm going to write it in a structurally recursive way. Um, so the, if I'm writing it in a structurally recursive way, the general form of the function looks like this. I have, I do something when I have the empty list and if it's a cons, I know what the result is for the rest of the list. And I know what the first element of the list is. And somehow using these two pieces of information together, um, I should be able to tell what the answer is for append element list. And so, so I, I, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say for the empty case, would you just want to cons the element onto the, onto the list? Yep. So we can cons um, elements onto the list. And by the way, this is the same as just saying, for example, we know that the list is empty. So this could also just be list elements. But um, yeah, so we're consing the elements onto the empty list. Good, that handles this case. And here, if I've appended the elements to the rest of the list, then how do I append it to the list? 
So by the way, this type of reasoning is exactly what you're going to be asked to do on the homework. So in the homework, um, I'm going to ask you to write all of the functions in a structurally recursive way, if you can. Um, if you really want to use an accumulator, you can do that as well, but I prefer that you write them in a structurally recursive way. And that's also a slightly more natural way to arrive at the answers. So the way that you think about this is you have a challenge. The challenge is to write a function that um, appends an element to a list, puts it in its last position. And then you say, well, how do I append an element to the empty list? Okay, I just cons it on. Uh, it doesn't have to go after anything. It's just the list of that element. Well, otherwise, let's suppose that I've appended an element to some list. And then I want to find out what the list looks like when instead of appending it to rest list, I append it to list. So in other words, here's an example. Um, append, I know this, right? Now I can form a list in which I cons, let's say uh, 23 onto this list, right? So what's the result then? It's gonna be in the first position. 23, so list 23, 1, 2, 3. And what else? Well, that's what happens when you cons it on, but what happens when I append 17 to this list? That is going to be in the last position. Right, but now that's also equal to cons what? Is this list empty? Is this the empty list? No. So it's a cons. So what is the cons of? Cons of what onto what? Uh, the list 23, 1, and 2. Uh, well, the first, uh, let, let, let's look at this. First of this list is what? It's just 23. It's not the list containing 23. So it's not cons of the list uh, list 23. It's just cons of 23, right? Okay. On to what? Append. 17. No, no, uh, just rewriting it at uh, this list, just this list. I just want to rewrite this list as cons 23 of onto something, onto a list. What is that list? List 1, 2, 3, 17. So in other words, look, if I have this answer, append 17, list 1, 2, 3, then I can form a pen 17 cons 23 list one, two, three. How? By consing 23 onto that answer, right? So would you just want to replace the ellipsis with just cons? Yep. So if we now run this, ah, append is already defined, my append. I could have searched and replaced, I know. So let's try it. Oops. And then it does it. So uh, we've defined the function of append, right? Uh, my append. And now we want to write reverse in a structurally recursive way. Um, so if we're trying to reverse the empty list, what's the results? Empty list. 
Yes, we can also just return the list itself, right? Yeah. Okay, now if you've reversed the rest of the lists and you have the first of the list, how do you form the reverse of the entire list? Append the first of the list onto the reverse of the rest. Good. So let's just look at this definition right here. And let's try my reverse. Ah, thank you, my append. Actually, I'll save this as. And let's also look at the trace. Okay, so, well, let's just see, Let, let's look at how this function behaves. So I'm going to skip several steps until I get to the next call. Uh, again, ignore most of these definitions, just look at the thing at the bottom. My reverse list, one, two, three, four. So after, when it makes the next recursive call, it'll replace my list, my reverse list, one, two, three, four, with append one, onto uh, reverse of the rest, right? Then skipping a few steps, going to the next call, it'll say my appends two to that, then my append three to that, then my append four, and then it'll say my reverse of the empty list. Then how's that going to get evaluated? Well, um, that gets replaced with this con statement. What's the first part of the con? It's empty. Uh, is the empty list empty? It is. So then it gets replaced with the empty list. And then it'll ask to my, call my append on the empty list. Let's skip to the next call. So that's list four. Then three is put at the back. Well, actually it brings it in uh, recursively, my append three onto the empty list. Then when it says my appends to, this function is also structurally recursive. So what happens when you call my append onto a list is that it takes my append of two of the rest of the list and conses the head of this list onto it. So you'll see that it does this by first bringing four out front, then bringing three out front, and then it's calling my append two onto the empty list. And that just becomes two. And then it replaces it onto list. And then you're trying to append one onto this list. How does it do that? Well, it's structurally recursive. So it just pulls the four out front in a cons, the three out front, the two out front, and then my append onto the empty list, and then it finishes. Let's do those last steps individually. It's the empty list. That's true. So it returns cons one empty list. So uh, notice, okay, so when we write a structurally recursive function then, there are two phases. First off, this function structurally recursively pushes my reverse inside into the arguments. And every single time it pushes it in on the outside, we get a my appends. But um, this just green thing, the my append stays there. The green thing gets replaced with this, and then this, and then this, and then this. And then finally, when you're there, uh, all of these have to resolve. And then they resolve by also being structurally recursive functions. There's like a lot of great symmetry to this. <laughs>
Okay. Uh, so that was an incredibly extended answer to your question. However, it was something that I was planning to do later after uh, the next big. Um, so here is an example of a function that doesn't return a number. It returns a list. And we went to the function of defining reverse. And first we defined it with an accumulator. And then we defined it structurally recursively. And in the course of thinking about how to define it structurally recursively, basically the way that we solved that is we looked at what reverse should do. We looked at an example. We drew a tree and we said, well, when we reverse this tree, we get this tree. And then you say, okay, well, if I know how to reverse this tree, suppose I con something onto the front of it. Well, how does the result change? And then you see, well, the result changes in this way. But then if you want to do that, then you need a function to append. And then you should write one. And I do, although it's built into the library as well. Any questions about that? So today's class was really about how to design functions. Um, and the general way to do it when you want to define some recursive function on a list, if you want to do it in a structurally recursive way, and you can do, you can write anything in a structurally recursive way. Sometimes it's less efficient. For example, for my reverse, um, it's a much less efficient algorithm if you write it structurally recursively. But we're not worrying about efficiency at the moment. But the difference between those two reverse functions is that one is efficient and the other is actually amenable to proving theorems about it. OK, so if you want to write a structurally recursive function, and also it's sometimes easier to think through it like this, the template is this. If it's just a structurally recursive function of a single list argument, you write a con statement, you write what happens in the empty case. And then for the successor case, or rather for the cons case, you write how you go from the answer of my function applied to the rest of the list and the information of what the first of the list is, how those two are put together to give you the answer of what my function should be on list. Uh, by the way, this type of reasoning is exactly what's on your homework assignment this weekend. Any questions? Are you going to send us the code you wrote today? Yes, I am. It's actually already really nicely formatted uh, with a bunch of things. And by the way, so uh, let me remark a few things about how I wrote the code today. Um, so for each function, um, I started off by writing the name of the function as a comment. And then I wrote the signature of the function. So um, if the, this function really, what is it intended for? Um, you can pass some lists. You can give it a number zero and it'll somewhere in the middle of the function, not at the header of the function encounter an error when it takes first, right? Um, but so this function really isn't enforcing the contract that it takes a list of numbers. It'll start evaluating the function and somewhere in the middle of the function, you're going to run into an error. But the way that I've written the function is that if it takes any list of numbers, then the output should be a number. 
In fact, how do I know that? Well, what I'm about to do is I'm about to prove it. Uh, but uh, I, really the function is intended to be called only on lists of numbers, not on lists of other things, specifically lists of numbers. And so I write in the contract that this is a function that takes a list of numbers and then this arrow, um, well, you, you can write it in different ways. You can write the implication arrow if you want, but it's not the implication arrow. It means just that's the input and the output is a number. It takes a list of numbers and it returns a number. And then I write it one line to describe what the function does. Some list sums the numbers in the list. And then this is just a helpful comment that this is defined in a structurally recursive way. And then I follow the templates for list recursion. It's a con, I do the empty case, I do the other case. Here, uh, there are two parameters. I separated them with a multiplication sign. But anyway, that's just some notation. So I say what the signature of the function is. So this is called the signature of a function. A, you should think of it maybe as like a user defined contract. Um, if this function, when given a list of numbers and a number will return a number. If you give it other things, it might fail. Um, but I claim that uh, when you give it what is in the contract, then the function will be well behaved. And so I'm designing a function that always never returns an error and always works if it's given a list of numbers and a number. Again, descriptive line and then comments. And then sometimes um, if I want to clarify what the function does, I can write some comments. And then these are other things. So uh, in general, if you're having trouble writing functions, you should usually start with uh, a description like this in comments with the name of the function, the signature of the function, which by the way, in other programming languages, functions you can enforce at compile time uh, that they satisfy uh, type constraints. In Racket, it's dynamically typed. What does dynamically typed mean? Dynamically typed means that uh, at runtime, you might get a type error. If you try and say, for example, plus one false, it will run into a, ty a type error. Um, and it'll do so at the stage when it starts to, when it wants to compute plus. Um, sometimes you can have other programming languages, as we'll see at the end of the class, uh, which have much stronger enforcement of these constraints. They don't come up only when something tries to get evaluated. The programming language knows at the start that something will produce a type um, error. Or, or that's not necessary that it'll produce a type error, but that it has something that has potential to produce a type error. Rather, you can have programming languages, strongly typed programming languages, that essentially prove theorems about the type safety of their program uh, when you run them. Okay, that, that's the digression. But Racket is dynamically typed, which means errors happen on the fly as you're running things. Um, but so, Things like this, signatures, are only described to people who use the function, how the function is intended to be used. But they also help you as a person that's designing the function to know what tools you have at your disposal. So for example, here I run plus. If it was a list of any, then plus wouldn't make sense necessarily. So signatures also tell you in the scope of possible functions that you can use, what types are available. And if you know you have a function that takes a list of numbers specifically, then it's probably going to use some information about numbers. And then that's even gives you a hint that when you're trying to write the structurally recursive case, or I guess this one is written structurally recursively, that you should probably use some function about numbers because some list doesn't make sense for non-number things. Uh, so those are some hints about how to define program, uh, how to work out what functions should be. And you see that if you start with uh, writing these lines of comments, 
And then you follow the template of either writing things structurally recursively or structurally recursively with an accumulator, uh, then it's just a matter of filling in the blanks. And that's a much simpler question. It reduces it from how do I write something to how do I fill in the blanks in this specific template? And that helps you think through problems. And your homework this weekend will be to think through several problems like this. Well, two ones. The second one is very tricky, by the way. But um, if you follow these recipes, uh, you'll be able to get it. Okay, uh, at the last section of the class, I want to show you some proofs. Oh, does anyone have any questions first? Wait, is the regular end time of this lecture 4.15 or 4.45? Four 4.45. 4.45, okay, good. Uh, then what I'd like to do, if there aren't any questions, is take another five minute break and then we'll look at some arguments. And um, so I said that structurally, stru writing structurally recursive functions makes it much easier to prove things about things. So I'll give you an example with some list and uh, some list two. And it'll be very analogous to the difference between plus and add. It's hard to prove theorems about add. The easiest way to do it is to show that it's equivalent to plus. Similarly, it's going to be hard to prove theorems about sum list two, and the easiest way to do it is to be just to show that it's equivalent to sum list. Any questions? So I'll definitely send you this code. And I'll also add a few more comments uh, writing what the template is for structurally recursive functions. So let's say we're taking a break until 405. And the first thing that I'm going to do is just type in the template. 
Okay, I'll be back in a minute. Okay, let's resume. Uh, does anyone have any questions about what we had before? So um, I'm now going to prove things, but I'm not going to do it in the template that I was doing before. That's a very rigid template. I'm just going to write things that you can convert into that template. So, uh, for example, well, first off, what are we going to discuss? Uh, we are going to discuss how to prove things about And then the two things are sum list and sum list two. The first is structurally recursive. And the second uses an accumulator. <laughs> 
So first, at a very informal level, and it um, has to be informal because how do you make the statement uh, formal in the first place? So consider the statements Uh, the claim that's some list sums the numbers in the list. Of numbers. Well, um, how do I formally write down the statement that some list sums the list of uh, uh, the list of numbers in a list of numbers, sums the numbers in a list of numbers? Uh, sort of, it's hard to write down a formal statement because that. But informally, well we would argue by structural induction on lists. Then case empty. Maybe I'll write it as a word. In the empty case, if we look at uh, some list of the empty list, then that, by the definition, is zero. And that's what we want. So I'll put a check mark. And then in the inductive case, cons, let's say number, onto a list. Well, if, so we use the anonymous method. Uh, well, okay, we're doing it by structurally induction on list. Uh, so by structural induction, no, um, we say uh, to prove for all numbers. And, and all lists of numbers um, let's say LST or let's do a script L that if uh, some list of um, L is the sum of the numbers in L, then some list cons of N onto L is the sum of um, cons and L. Again, I, 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 I even have difficulty writing the statement formally because what does it mean is the sum of the elements in L? Um, well, then the proof would be some lists. You'd, uh, you'd uh, do the anonymous method and then 
on both arguments. And then eventually you'd start computing. Uh, list. And that, by the definition, reduces to plus n some list l. And assuming that some list is the sum of the elements in the list l, then um, we aren't clear on what the statement of what we're trying to prove is, but the sum of the elements in cons n l should be the sum of the elements in l plus n. So that should work. So this is a convinced, compelling informal argument. Now, let's say that we try and prove something else. Uh, so when we want to prove things with an accumulator, uh, we run into issues. Let's try and prove now being formal this time, or at least more formal, that um, for all lists of numbers, L that some helper of L with the accumulator zero is equal to some list L. So this statement now we can state the hypothesis exactly for all lists of numbers. Well, first off, the universe of lists of numbers, um, assuming that we've made sense of numbers, if we assume that uh, we have lists of numbers, let's say L O N, list of number. Well, what is that? That is either the empty list or it is cons. of a number in onto a list of numbers. And there's a structural uh, structural induction principle for any inductively constructed thing, not just nats. And we're going to try and prove that statement using that structural induction principle. So by structural induction on N, by L on L. Any questions about that? So far, does everyone understand the statements? So you're going to show that you're using the structural recursion that is um, equivalent to using some within a calculator. That's, None. they give the same answer at least. So some helper is this one of the accumulator and then some list is just this one where um, when you it's given a cons, it just takes the head and puts it as a plus out front. And then some helper on the other hand, when it's given a cons, it takes the head of that and adds it to the accumulator. So uh, I haven't told you what the principle of structural induction is as a proof rule for lists of numbers, but um, it'll come out from this. So let's say two proof 
okay, not to prove, there are two cases. So now we go into case analysis. So first we have case, uh, and I'm going to call this the case empty. And then in here, what we should prove is that some helper of the empty list with zero is the same as some list zero. Some list, sorry, some list, empty list. That's the base case of the structural induction. And uh, this follows from a weak compute block. Now, um, in this argument, I'm not going to, uh, I haven't named the rules. So I I'm not going to provide justifications for the names uh, if, if it's just a computation step. Well, that's just zero. And that's also what we get when we apply some list of the empty list. So that works out. Now in the next case, which I'll call cons number onto list of numbers. What we're supposed to prove now, instead of just being a for all statement on all numbers that you could be the successor of, uh, cons is have two. Uh, where is my pen? Here's my pen. Uh, for all numbers, or rather, let's um, let's introduce a piece of notation. If um, no, okay. If n is any number. And uh, let's say what's another good letter for a list as opposed to and uh, T uh, is any list list of numbers. Uh, let's P of N and T denote the statement No, uh, this is bad. Sorry, sorry. If T is any list, let P of T denote the statement that some helper T zero is equal to some list t. There, that's better. Now, what we need to prove is that the following. For all numbers n, and all lists t 
list of numbers C. That's P of C implies P of cons N. like this. Then we do, uh, le uh, so let's um, n be any number. I'm not going to write by the anonymous method and um, assume P of T. So I'm applying the anonymous method and I'm applying hypothetical reasoning and I'll call this in hype. Then if I start the calculation, so to prove P of cons and T, I start with the definition of some helper. I look at cons and C. And in one step, that gets reduced to what? Well, I mean, in several steps, but what's the next major step? Anyone? So if I apply some helper onto a cons, uh, what does it do? Some helper is this accumulator function. Go ahead. It has to return a number. Right, but what does it do? What does some helper, the accumulator version of uh, some lists, uh, do when it's given a cons? I mean, how was, did some helper work? What was the idea behind some helper? Um, some helper TN. Uh, let's write it as plus. Oh, plus N, um, N to zero. zero. Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, now, okay, that can also reduce to zero, but the problem is now it's very similar to what happened with um, add. Um, if we look at add and we move an S over, then instead of having zero, suddenly you have something that's non-zero. And your inductive hypothesis isn't very useful because your inductive hypothesis says something about um, only things that have a zero here, right? So it doesn't look like we can do much from there. Um, so then it's really like question mark, question mark. But eventually, if you consider the expression uh, sum list of cons n onto t, then what does that reduce to in one step? I mean, after, what's the next major step? Well, what does sumless do when it encounters a cons? 
I guess like intuitively, when you have some list of a cons, you're like adding n to the sum list of t. Yep. So um, when when we were doing the stepper and we pressed next recursive call, it went through several steps, and that's what it would do. So that's the next recursive call. And um, what we see is, OK, well, how do we go between then? And then we're sort of stuck. And then it turns out that the way to get unstuck is to change what you're trying to prove. Um, so we'd like to compare Uh, some list, some helper, T, uh, let's say, val some value with plus accumulator, some list. Uh, T, right? If we could compare these two, that would be nice. Uh, and so instead of trying to prove the original uh, thing, uh, that suggests that maybe we should try to prove this. If we try and prove this, then uh, the original results follows by setting um, the original results follows by setting accumulator to zero. And then instead of this, you try, uh, you change the claim. You prove a stronger result. The stronger result is for all numbers. Accumulator. And for all lists, list of numbers, L, that's some helper. L accumulator is equal to plus accumulator um, sum list L. So this is a stronger result, um, but it turns out that proving the stronger results will give us the mileage that we need uh, for proving the thing. And then well, the proof mirrors the thing that we had above. Um, we use the anonymous uh, method on accumulator and uh, structural induction on L. Then case, so um, accumulator is any nuts. Uh, case uh, of the empty is basically the same as above. Um, you look at some helper of the empty list with any accumulator, and that just becomes the accumulator. And that's the same as uh, plus accumulator with zero. And that's the same as plus accumulator with some list empty. So that covers that case. And then in the inductive case, Basically, uh, you want uh, for any list 
lets uh, P of T denotes Remember that ACE accumulator is being treated anonymously as before. And then um, we want to prove that for any number n, and any list of numbers t that um, p of t implies p of cons n onto t. Then we treat n anonymously And we um, we treat both anonymously. And we assume P of T. And that's the inductive hypothesis. So I'm now applying several methods at once. Uh, and then we compute. So now we just want to prove P of cons and T. And we start with some helper. Then we have cons and T. And we have whichever accumulator we had before. OK, what do we do? How do we work with some helper? Is it going to equal some helper T and plus N with uh, accumulator? Good. Now, what does our inductive hypothesis say? That some helper T with the accumulator equals the sum of the accumulator and sumless oh. T. Okay, I guess, uh, 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 I see. Do not use the anonymous method on the accumulator. Um, so we would like to prove it for all. Uh, so in other words, the statement now um, accumulator isn't uh, anonymous. Let's denote for all accumulator. So this statement should also be a for all statement. Okay. Uh, yes, let's prove it for that. Um, so uh, then we actually say uh, let's accumulator be any. But now when we're applying the inductive hypothesis, that's also a for all statement. So it also applies to not just this value of accumulator, it applies to all values of accumulator uh, as had above. Okay, uh, so uh, I had to correct it. We do not start at the beginning by um, using the anonymous method on the accumulator. 
actually, if you think about the pr second homework problem, uh, that's the way that it was solved as well, right? Um, if you started by using the anonymous method, that wouldn't be strong enough. Uh, you'd like to, you would like actually for your inductive hypothesis and that argument to be a for all statement. So I'm slightly modifying my uh, thing. Okay, but now that the inductive hypothesis is a for all statement, okay, now I can apply the inductive hypothesis and what do I get? You were saying? Well, you were about to say it. Go ahead. Uh, let me just try to find where I was. Yeah, so if, so the sum of n and then and the accumulator is also a, an accumulator, so it follows from the inductive hypothesis that this is equal to the sum of the accumulator, in this case is n plus uh, plus n accumulator and some list of t. Yes. And now uh, we apply associativity and commutativity of addition. So uh, what would we like? We'd like some list um, cons um, of n onto t, right? So I'd like to have addition here. So using commutativity of addition, I can write this as accumulator n. And then associativity, which we haven't proven for Nats, but we can't prove for Nats. In fact, someone actually did it on the homework. Good job. But it also holds for all numbers, which is uh, what we care about. And And then doing this calculation backwards, what do I get here? How can I rewrite plus n sum list t? Um, some list counts and t. And if we looked at what our goal was, okay, so we let accumulator be any accumulator. Um, then we can say, uh, I guess in red, since that's the adjustment that I made, hence uh, for all accumulators. Uh, the statement holds. Uh, well, actually, what's the statement? The statement is um, some helper uh, consent T of the accumulator. So I only used the anonymous method on the accumulator uh, when proving this. I wanted my statement P to be a for all statement. That's something that I discovered I needed to do, which is the way that this um, homework two works as well. Possibly. And I'll mark the step where I use the inductive hypothesis here. Uh, so this step was justified by the inductive hypothesis. And the rest of the steps were justified by um, the computation rules, which I didn't give names. Uh, which is what we wanted to prove. Uh, we've proven the inductive case. Uh, we assumed P of T, we've proved this. And so we close everything off and then we're done. And so we prove, uh, we uh, can conclude the proof uh, by structural induction. And then I write QED.
So that was a sketch of an argument, but it's you, actually basically uh, you just carefully do a few things and then that's the proof of this results. Uh, and this really uses structural induction, not on numbers, but on lists of numbers and the definitions. So, and the original result that we want to prove follows by setting accumulator equals to zero. Um, now, so when you have things with accumulators, you can prove that they're correct, but it requires a bunch of work. It's much easier to prove it if you just have structural recursion. Why? Because the inductive case is immediate. The inductive case is immediate because, well, you have your answer onto the next level of thing that you constructed in terms of the answer that you had before. And so when you're trying to prove something about it inductively, it's already in terms that you like. Um, if you sort of think about it, uh, when you look at uh, the method of an accumulator, it's similar to reverse. Uh, if you had, for example, the list of one, two, three, four, then if you sum list this, it becomes sum one, sum two, sum three, sum four with zero. In other words, um, as we were drawing pictures, this is the last thing that I'm going to do for today. Uh, if you have cons, uh, cons, so cons one, two, three, four, empty list, then the structurally recursive definition changes that into plus one onto plus two onto plus three onto plus four with zero. Meanwhile, the definition that uses um, an accumulator starts with zero, it starts with zero, and then it adds one to zero, right? So if you start off with zero, which is your original value of the accumulator, then you add one to it, then you take this result, and then you add two to it, and then to this result, you add three, and then to that result, you add four, and then you get to the empty list, and so you just return the accumulator. Um, so the version with the accumulator really does the addition backwards. If you con something on, that's the first thing that gets added to zero, right? And so it's much easier to prove things uh, if you prove it about uh, the structurally recursive one. Okay, so the last um, 45 minutes of class, this argument, uh, that was a bit at a higher level. And I wanted to show you what the structural induction principle is uh, for lists. And also the lesson is that, well, if you found it hard, then good, uh, because it is hard to prove things about functions which are written in a non-structurally recursive way. Uh, so the lesson, is to write structurally recursive functions. That's the moral of the last thing that we did. Now, as a final thing, so okay, the homework this weekend, I don't have tests up yet, uh, but the problem statements are there, except for the fact that one of them isn't complete.
And uh, it really asks you to reason about things like this. So I'm about to send you this document. The template for writing structurally recursive functions is this on lists. And then we worked through some definitions of functions that used accumulators and stru functions that were uh, structurally recursive on lists. And as we saw here, we had to write helper functions. For example, we had to write append as a helper function. My append. Um, and on the homework, you'll similarly encounter things where you need to figure out, oh, I need to write a helper function. How do you figure out that you need to write a helper function? Well, you think about it structurally recursively. You try and fill in the blanks. You say, how is the answer to the previous case related to the next one? And then if it's related in a way that you can picture, for example, there we saw we wanted to replace the empty list at the end of the cons tower with cons of something onto the empty list. And then you said, well, how do I do that? Well, that can be accomplished by some other function, append. And then we try and write append structurally recursively. And then we get through this. So follow this template. This is how you should think through the homework. And if you write things structurally recursively, the answer will fall out. It's similar to exactly how we were writing proofs before. It's the same form of reasoning. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say for today. Are there any questions? Also, did people find the first uh, two hours of this class where I discussed how to develop these functions useful for building intuition on how to write programs? Yes. Yeah, it's, yes. it's helpful. Okay. So yeah, yesterday was le more less disorganized, uh, more disorganized than I had hoped because I was caught up with a meeting that was happening immediately afterwards. But today I'm like, okay, I want to carefully, carefully explain how to solve problems. And so I did that. And then the last section was, okay, well, if you want to prove things, it's hard to prove things about non-structurally recursive functions. And also I introduced what the principle of um, structural induction was on lists. But you don't have to worry about that for the moment. Later, I'll we'll ask you to write a proof, but not now. On the weekend, you're worrying about what? You are worrying about how to write some structurally recursive functions that process lists. Right? OK. Um, uh, if there aren't any more questions, are there? Question. Is it possible yep. to have both homeworks do on Sunday? I'm fine with that, but uh, actually, I'm uh, the homework that's due on Sunday is uh, harder than the one that's due on Saturday. If you have any specific time thing, you can just send me an email asking about it, but I don't want to make both due on Sunday because uh, people will solve one but not the other. But if anyone has specific time schedule things, they can send me an email uh, saying what the excuse is. Um, but uh, I am going to keep the deadlines because um, you should start thinking about the permutation problem ahead of time. It's harder, uh, but I'll give more information. I'll also define what a permutation is in the problem, which isn't currently defined. Uh, the tests aren't up on Marmoset, but uh, the description of the, well, the description of both problems theoretically is complete if you know what a permutation is. Um, but the first problem is described completely. And then I'll be about to send you this file and then you can start working on both right away. Marmoset tests hopefully up today before I go to sleep. Hopefully correctly. I had to redo Marmoset tests three times. I'll be much more careful about setting tests. And um, today's homework then, I think the tests are correct. And um, if there's any emails that you sent me that I haven't replied to, uh, maybe send me a heads up notification again, if in case I missed anything. Okay, good luck on this weekend's homework. Um, I'm sort of making it be that the homework on the weekend is the boss battle of the homework. So you're working on some tricky problems. And email me if you have any help. Okay, have a good weekend. Enjoy the problems. Thanks. See you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks.